Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to talk this morning about taking hold of Christ and the new self. So I came up with an allegory. You know what an allegory is? I don't, but I came up with one anyway. It's a, uh, it's a story or an illustration that uh, mimics or is to give insight into another story. Uh, I think all of us here probably are aware of, or maybe you know somebody, or perhaps you've been a victim yourself, but you know somebody who is involved in an abusive relationship, a hurtful relationship. And it breaks your heart when you see that, and, and you try to help, and you, and you wonder, and you think, and you, you, you struggle with this. Why does this person stay in this relationship? They're, it's not safe, it's not good this person, this friend that I care about, it could kill them, you know, and, and you talk to that person, and, and they, they have their reasons, they have their excuses, well, it's not as bad as you think, or this person is, we, we have good times together too, yes, he did this, or she did this, but they were sorry about it, and finally it comes up, but where would I go, and what would I do, and, and this is all I know, and, and you tell them, there are people out there, this isn't, the only person in the world, and you can have a new life and a, and a better life. And, and this person starts to believe that and, and actually is open to uh, walking away from this bad thing that she's or he has been involved in. And, and you find a, and you have this perfect friend for them, and you set them up, and they, and they connect. And it's a good relationship because you've known this other person for a long time, and you know they're just a good, decent person. And they're a good match, and it seems to be working out well as they're dating and getting to know each other. But one day you walk into a dinner party they were invited to, and uh, your friend is there, the new friend, the new person that your other friend <laughs> had walked away from and is now dating. But he was alone now. So you go up to him and say, well, what, what's going on? Where's, I thought you were bringing uh, our friend. And, and he says, well, uh, we planned on, but it's just not working out just didn't work out. And, and you're shocked. Say, why is that? You were a perfect match. You were so good for her. It's what she needed. And, and, and what happened? And, and he says, well, she started to bring her ex all the time on our dates and our functions. And, and I'd see them walking down the street at times and holding hands. And, you know, she just wouldn't let go. And he became more and more of our, of our commitment. And, and I had to tell her it's you know, it's not going to work out this way. If you're going to hold on to that X, you're not going to be able to hold on to me. And that was a sad story, but what's really sad is that is a good picture of our spiritual walk. You have to think about it in this way here, and that is the way that we used to live before we came to know Jesus Christ and, and, and before we put our trust in him and believe that he died on the cross for our sins. Uh, we walked in abusive relationships with this world. I'm not talking about with people, but the, the world and the, the values of this world, they were, they were destroying our lives. And, and, and that's why we come to Christ, because we say, I, I don't want to live this way. I don't want to live with this guilt and this shame. And I want forgiveness, and I want a new life. And you come to Christ, and, and it, it's wonderful and things like that. But before long, you look, uh, it doesn't take long for some of us to notice your, your hand is still holding on to your ex. And you're trying to bring your ex, that abusive relationship you had with the world and the values of this world, into this relationship with Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, it's just not going to work. It's, you've, got to, you've got to walk away. But they keep following us, following me. They won't leave me alone. And he's going to tell you really clear then, you have to kill it. Because if you don't put it to death, it will never leave you alone. And if you want to hold on to Christ, you're going to have to let go of the world. And when you let go of the world, what do you have left but this new self that Christ gives you? And the new self, as we're going to see today, when, when Paul talks about it, I'll tell you that new self is your spirit that has been regenerated. By that I mean it's been given new life by the Holy Spirit, and now it is alive to God, and it is now able to walk away from that old abusive relationships and it is one who now has eternal life and hope and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And that's the new self. But it is a long journey for us. 
And I think each and every one of us here, if we're honest with ourselves, I will tell you that I still can turn around at times without realizing I've taken hold of my old life and trying to hang on to it because sometimes it was the only thing I knew and sometimes it seemed to work and sometimes I actually enjoyed it or whatever it is. And Jesus will look at me and said, Roger, as long as you're holding on to that, your hand is not free to hold on to me. Let's talk about that today. So turn to Colossians chapter 3 and our journey through this wonderful letter to a church that is uh, so much like our churches are today. And we're going to be seeing two things here, like the title says, what does it mean, or the encouragement of, uh, that God gives us to take hold of Christ and to take hold of that new life. Let's begin by looking at this verses 1 through 4 and and see what he says to us. And you remember the last few weeks we were looking at the fact that uh, false teachers had come into the church. Uh, They were false prophets, false teachers, and they were introducing things to the people saying, you know, Jesus isn't enough. You have to do these additional things. You have to, uh, for for some teachers they're saying, you have to live this ascetic life, which means you deny yourself everything. You live like a pauper. You act like a pauper. You don't do anything that's good for you or fun or enjoyable. You live miserable. And uh, you have to do that. Others were saying, uh, well, everything of the flesh is not of Christ anyway. It's not of the Spirit. So you can do anything you want in the flesh. You can be involved in any kind of immorality you want because it really doesn't count. Because your spirit is different than your flesh. That's another false teaching that was going on. Then you had the angel worshipers in the church. They would come and say, hey, you know, you, you, let me give you a name of an angel we need to worship. You need to worship this angel or, or that angel or whatever. And all these kind of false doctrines were, were enslaving people into believing that I have to be involved and do these things. Otherwise, you know, I have no hope to be with Christ or to have eternity. And Paul really just uh, took care of that. We heard a great message last week about it. And today he's going to say, now that you've, uh, I've shown you that these things are out there, I'm going to tell you what to do with them. Okay? So let's look at verses 1 through 4 together. He says, If then, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated, seated at the right hand of I'm sorry, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above and not on things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, you will also appear with him in glory. So Paul is um, talking about these Let's just say theological truths. And theology is a study of, of the scriptures, a study of God. And he, it's so important that we get our thinking right about what is true and what is false. Because if you're not thinking about what is true, you're thinking about things that can have really a harmful negative effect on you. And so these false teachers were able to come in and introduce these evil, wicked, legalistic ideas for one reason is because people didn't know the truth. And it's almost like if they had a blank slate, you can write anything you want on it. What Paul here is basically saying, let's fill that mind of yours with truth. And as you fill your mind with truth, there will be no room for that which is false to come on. So he says this, and I hope you can read this here. He says, since then you have been raised with Christ. You know what's interesting here is Paul is not assuming anything. He's not assuming that everybody in the church in Colossia is saved. And the other thing he's not assuming is even if you are saved, he's not going to assume that you're walking with Christ and that you're finding fulfillment in this life. I think many people have tried Christianity and even are saved by their faith but still struggle with making this Christian walk work for them and it can be very frustrating. So Paul is saying, since then, you have been raised with Christ, or it could be if then you have been raised with Christ. Well, what does it mean be raised with Christ? Well, to be raised means you must have been down first, right? It means you were dead. 
and we were dead. You're, you're, basically, you're born dead. Isn't that a, a weird thing to think about? A new baby is born dead, but not forgotten by God, and not loved, uh, not, certainly not unloved by God. They are loved, and if some tragedy happens to an infant or a young child, I don't know what the age of accountability is, I am personally convinced, and I have scripture to support this, that child will go to be in heaven. You know, so he makes them alive. But, but you have been, de- you were born dead, and as you get older, you realize you're dead, and you realize the fact that, you know, I'm dead because I've got this guilt in me. I've sinned against God, and, and I want forgiveness. And Jesus is the only one who can provide that forgiveness. And so we place our faith, we believe in him, and we receive him. And when we do that, he raises us. What? We'll see in a second, okay. But he raises. So he says, since you've been raised with Christ, set your hearts on the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So now he's saying, listen, folks, these, these legalistic people out there, these, these false teachers are enslaving you. They're holding you down. They're not letting you be free from the earthly things that, that you um, were engrossed in, that, that captivated you that enslaved you. They want you to keep coming back and eating of this food and keeping your mind on that. And what Paul is saying, no, no, let's do something different. Let's do what's right. Let's take your mind off of those things that are down here that you were living in when you were dead. And now put your mind in the things in heaven where Christ is seated. He says, uh, set your hearts. And actually, this is, a, this is out of the New International Version. In your English Standard Version that I read, it says, uh, set your mind. I think the mind is probably the more accurate word there. But either one, okay, it doesn't matter. Mind, heart, they're kind of, can be interchanged at this point right here. Give your mind, your heart will follow, okay? And so give your heart to things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And we know what that means, right? Unless you're left-handed, then you're, you'll always be confused. But the scriptures always talk about the right hand of God because that's the stronger part. That's where, the, where you sit, the right hand. That's where the uh, place of, of honor is. And Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. And guess who else is sitting there, sitting there right now? That's what he's telling you. Guess who else is sitting at the right hand of the Father right now? It can't be any of you because you're sitting there, right? But it is you. And this is this this confusing thing that we live in here because we we have real bodies. This is is not fake. I'm a real person. You're a real person. We're really here in this building here. But God says, no, you're, you're with me. You're at the right hand of God, and he says, I want you to set your minds on these things above. And, and to set your minds on it is, is actually, it's, 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 it's like, this is the truth. And if I could, when I, when I read this, and I'm pouring my thoughts into it and taking the thoughts out of it and putting it on my mind, I'm setting my mind on this. We set our minds on a lot of things, right? Whatever project you're doing, if you're really into it, unless you're distracted, you're putting your mind into it. You're setting your mind on it. What Paul is saying here is, don't let these guys take your mind away from the truth. The truth is, in heaven, put your mind there. Realize that that's where you are in God. And not on, and he says, set your things on things above and not on earthly things. So what are the earthly things he's talking about? Obviously, not everything in this world is evil, right? There's a lot of earthly things that are not evil. It's not evil to enjoy creation. It's not evil to enjoy people. It's not evil to enjoy a meal with people. It's not evil to go on vacation. It's not evil to buy something that is new and enjoy that new thing. Those things aren't evil, but they they can become evil when? When do these things become evil? When they replace whom? God. When you start to give your hope into these things, as long as I have this, I'm safe. As long as I have this thing, I'm fulfilled. As long as I have this, I have power. As long as I have this thing, I haven't, my ego is where it should be. That's when they become evil, the earthly things. Now, he's going to describe in more detail in our next section here 
some of the gross earthly things that are always evil. So there are things that are amoral that can quickly turn into moral things simply because of how we choose to use them and rely on them and trust them. And what, Jesus, what Paul is telling us here is, is these are things you have to get your mind off of. They have no eternal power over you unless you put your mind on them and give them that power. And you need to walk away from that thing. He goes on to say here, for you have died. I know it's kind of small words there. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. So how many of you here have died? I don't know if all of you have died yet. Are all of you in Jesus Christ? Is everybody here a person who has, has seen the sin that they have committed and said, I'm, I, I, I'm sad about that, I grieve over that. And you turn away from that. When you turn away from that, you have died to that. I don't think you can come to faith in Jesus Christ just because you want to go to heaven. I think you must come to the point where you are grieving and saddened and are recognizing your guilt for sin for offending God and hurting people and hurting yourself. And when you do that, you have died to that. You don't want to do that anymore, even though in practice we often do go back and do it again. Everybody, except for, you know, Jesus never sinned. I mean, we all have this propensity because even though the sin nature has been defeated, it's still active when we look to it, when we walk in it. So he says... For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. Why is it hidden there? It's, it's kind of like God ashamed of you and doesn't want, you know, when, when um, you need to clean up your room, you hide things underneath the bed, right? Because you don't want mom or dad to see your room needs to be cleaned up, so you just hide it. Is it because, uh, you know, you're out with somebody you shouldn't be, so you hide them? I don't want people to see me with you, so you hide that person. No, that's not what he's talking about. This is where you know you have something of immense value, tremendous value, and you want to do everything within your power to make sure nobody gets a hold of it. And you know there's thieves around here in the church. You know there's false teachers, false apostles, false prophets, the legalists who want to steal your hope. And what he is saying, they can't steal it because they can't find it. It's hidden. Christ took you, or God took you, and hid you from them. And by that he means he has made you absolutely safe and secure. You hide your valuables, right? When I, if you go out in my truck right now, you could find the keys, but they're hidden from you. I'm so lazy, I don't even put them in my pocket. Some of you lock your doors out there, and that's probably the smart thing to do. I'm just... I mean, that's what you do. You hide it. You, when you lock your car, you're hiding it from people being able to take it from you. And what God is saying here is these false teachers, they can't get you because you are out of their reach, out of their sight. They have no clue where you really are. Set your mind on that. Let your mind rest in it. Lay your head into that, figuratively speaking, and you will find yourself holding on to Christ. And not holding on to like he's kind of jerk you loose, but you're holding on to him in the sense of there's nothing else that I want to hold on to. If I um, uh, wanted to buy a car, and there's nothing wrong with buying a car, I would probably have to borrow the money to do it. And there's nothing wrong with having to borrow money to buy a car. That's not a sin. Uh, as long as you can make the payments, and the, and the lender will make sure you can make the payments, right? So go ahead and borrow money. But what happens when you uh, lose your job? Well, then your car that you love, that you've longed for, that you desired, that you just, you need your car because you've got to go to work and you've got to go buy groceries and, and all that kind of stuff. So it's a needed thing, it's a wanted thing, but now it's going to be taken away from you because um, you lost your job. Whether it was your fault or not, you lost your job. You can go to the bank and you can plead with them and, and they can show a lot of 
empathy for you or sympathy for you, but they're not going to let you, okay, here's the keys, you can have your car because I feel sorry for you. No, this is a business. And uh, you've got to pay for what you, what you take. Anyway, so you lose your car and you plead with them and you offer to do all kinds of things. You're going to try to get another job, but you've been out of work for six months now and just know you just can't make up the payments. You're so far behind. They just say, give us the keys. So you give them the keys. You're walking out the door. Uh, but then an hour later, you get a call back. Say, come back in because uh, your note has been paid off. You say, what do you mean? Just, just come on in. So you go back in there and the lender tells you this wonderful story that somebody who knows of you uh, wants to remain anonymous, but once knows of your situation, uh, um, they paid off your note. So they, they actually go in the drawer and come bring out the title and say, here's the title. It now belongs to you. Well, of course, you're just flabbergasted, right? And, uh, but then again, a couple days later, you know, you got a new job and things like that. You come into the bank to make a payment on it. And the president of the bank says, well, what are you doing this for? He says, well, I want to make sure I don't, nobody gets my car again. He says, nobody's going to take your car. You own it. It's been paid off. He says, well, I know that, but I just want to make sure. So I want to make some payments on this. I want to make sure I really own it. I want to make sure it really is mine. And, and the bank says, I gave you the title. It says, I know that, but, you know, trust me. No one's taking my car away from me again. So here's a couple back payments I owed you, and here's next month's payment. I'm going to be making my payments every month like we first agreed to because I want to make sure this car is mine. And what have they done? They're paying for something that's already been paid for. And we do that unbeknownst of us. It's offensive to the person who paid off the note, right? And when we try to pay again what Christ has already paid for, it's hurtful and offensive to him. And to God the Father, who said, I, 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 this is enough for me, it satisfies me. Well, I just want to make sure I'm really saved. I want to make sure I'm really close to you, God. I want to make sure I'm really seated at the right hand of Father. So I'm going to start doing things that I know to do. I'm going to be giving money to the church more regularly and sacrificially. I'm going to be reading my Bible more. I'm going to be witnessing more. Because I want to make sure I'm really, really saved. And God would say to you, you really, really are saved. Go ahead and do those things. For instance, you could tell the person who wants to make the car payments, again, I'll tell you what, you can take that money and give to somebody else who can't make car payments and help them out, but you're not going to help yourself. You're not improving your status one bit. For these false teachers who said you need to worship angels, you need to deny your flesh any kind of pleasure or nice things, or you need to... Um, uh, you, you can engage in any kind of sexual perversion you want because it's, you know, you're free to. And uh, none of those things will make you one quarter of an inch closer to Jesus than you already are. You cannot make yourself closer to Jesus by doing a single good thing. You just can't do it. And it's offensive to God when you try to convince God that you belong to be closer to Jesus simply because you have done more things to add on to what Jesus has already done for you. Some of these false t religions out there, whether it's Mormonism or Jehovah Witness who claim to be Christian, really are not. They're, they're, the basis, the foundation of the teaching is this. Jesus makes you savable. But you have to save yourself. Now we're going to get into some works that we have to do to be work out our salvation. And this is kind of weird. Everything I do here is weird, I guess. Taking hold of the new self, verses 5 through 10. Let's look at that together. Now the Apostle Paul goes on, he says, um, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In this you, want, you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, and you put on the new self, which is being renewed 
and the knowledge after the image of its creator. So now he's going to give us some works salvation stuff to do here. So I start off by saying, you know, there's nothing you can do to work to, to be saved, but now we're going to see that there are things that you must do to work your salvation through your life. And uh, what is interesting here are the tense of the voices of some of these verbs and the language. We know that there are verbs that are what they call uh, in a first person that that's you do to somebody else and and then the second person is you do it to yourself. Third person is somebody's doing it to you. What we're going to be looking at is, is God is saying, these are things you must do to yourself. I'm not going to do it for you. I will empower you. I'll encourage you. And I will strengthen you. And I'll help you show how you can do it. But you must do it to yourself. Otherwise, you won't take ownership of it. Right? So he says here um, in verse 5, he says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Now, put to death is a very uh, powerful world, word. It, um, it, it's, it can be said, slay it uh, again. Uh, it's, it's like this here. You, you think you've killed something. Go back and kill it again. It's like the old westerns. They don't shoot person once, they shoot him a hundred times. I know shooting is very hard emotionally these days with all the carnage and death and terrible things going on there. I'm somewhat reticent to use this as an illustration, but what it's saying here is you must go back and kill something and you must kill it again. That's what is baked. That's how powerful this word is. You must do it to yourself. Do put what to death? Uh, what is earthly in you? And again, not everything earthly is evil. But now it's going to be very graphic here and tell you what is going on in this church. And it probably helps us understand that some of the teaching again is this idea in in early first century Christianity and second century Christianity. There's this this false teaching called Gnosticism which taught that the spirit is good, the flesh is evil, but they're not really connected. So anything you do with the flesh is okay. It doesn't hurt your spirit. So what can you do? You can be involved in sexual immorality. You can have impurity in lifestyles, or impure lifestyles. You can have sexual passion in your life and indulge yourself in it. You can have these evil desires and, and even covetousness, which is idolatry. You can have it because it doesn't affect you. This kind of like free love society here. But what it really was, it was so self-destructive and destructive to other people. You know that sex is not wrong when it's done in a way that God designed it. But we're talking about immoral sex, which is the usury of other people for, for personal pleasure. Now, and outside of marriage, I should say. Outside the committed relationship, which is, which is the whole person. All right. So all of these, with, that, with the exception of the covetousness, has to do with sexual vice that he brings up, which tells us what is the problem with the church, which is some of the problems with Christianity today. And it is going on today and because we're afraid to, to say things to people because, well, they love each other, but they're not in a committed relationship. Or this free sex thing that's going on, and, and, and it's, it's, it's worldwide, it's, 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 it's Satan's most effective means to destroy the inner sense of people's dignity because it goes so deep within you. So he says, you must put to death these things. Again, once you think it's dead, go back there and kill it again. Slay it, utterly, utterly slay it. Now, how do you do that? Let's go on here. I think I can come up with an answer here. In which you also walked some time when you lived in them. Well, I didn't do all that stuff. You did things, we all did things that were similar. And the idea here is if you were to kept walking in that, you eventually would have walked right into that door of all those sexual vices. Most, not all people. You were part of that. You were part of it. Why do you want to go back to that thing that you said, I'm sorry about? I'm sorry, Jesus. I wish I didn't do that. I feel guilty. Then why are you going back there? That's what he's saying here. Why go back to do those things that now you're sorry about? But now you must rid yourself of all such things as these. It talks about anger and rage. Uh, in your ESV, that rage would be um, wrath, uh, malice and slander and filthy language from your lips. But now you must rid yourself. Now this word is, is a word that describes of casting something away. 
Before it was when it says put to death, it means slay it utterly. Kill it, kill it, kill it, kill it. When you think it's dead, kill it five more times. Because I'm going to tell you how it comes back to life if you don't. But now he's talking about cast away these things. Like cast away is like taking off dirty clothes and casting it away. And not going to your mom or your wife or whoever does, or yourself you do the laundry. Oh, I can wash this clean. So no, you cannot. Have you ever been skunked? I've never been skunked, but I think most of, if you ever have, uh, raise your hand, because I'm curious. Has anybody ever gotten skunked personally? You know what I mean by that, sprayed? Oh, okay, no, I mean a skunk skunk. You know, the, the black thing with the white stripe down it? Oh, yeah, your dog? Did you kill it? No, you didn't. You, didn't, you washed it, right? But, but the truth is, if I got skunked, I got to get rid of my clothes. I'm not going to wash them. Now, what I could do if I was smart, I'd just wear some new clothes over the old clothes, right? But that's what Christianity has fallen to sometimes. I'll just cover up my bad habits with a few good habits so people don't notice my earthly living when I, when I talk the talk and I go to church on Sundays and it's Bible study and I witness and things like that. I'm wearing my new clothes, but sooner or later that stench is still there. And what he's saying here, you have to take these things, this, this, uh, he calls it anger and rage. Anger is that seethingness inside, that rage is when it comes out and hurts people. That's anger and rage, or wrath. Anger, wrath, I got you with it. Uh, malice is that ill will towards people that comes out to slander them, to say things that cuts them to the chase, hurts them. And uh, filthy language from your lips, dropping the F-bomb and you know, think it's funny or, or telling dirty jokes or laughing at other people tell dirty jokes or, or calling people filthy names and things like that. Paul is saying, you, this, this doesn't have a, a place in your vocabulary today. You don't have to sound cool to people. It doesn't, the only people it impresses are people that you don't need to impress them. It doesn't impress Jesus. You've got a good vocabulary. He says, now take that rage in you and cast it off like it's clothing that has been skunked. Don't try to do anything but burn it. Cast it away. And be renewed. And learn to know your creator and become like him. So let me ask you this. How do we do this? How do we put to death something that needs to be put to death? And how do we give life to something that is worthy of life? Well, it goes back to the very first uh, verse 1. He says, If you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. In verse 2, set your mind on things above. The setting your mind on that, you will give life to that which you set your mind to. So you will give life to your heavenly existence and the Spirit of God that dwells within you where he encourages you, he gives you hope, he gives you he teaches you, he admonishes you if you need to be admonished, but he's there as a great comforter. When you put your mind on that, this is a reality. It, become, uh, it becomes more of a real thing in your life. Okay, So if that's what gives it life, then what must give it death? You can put the Spirit of God in a, in a practical way to death in you. You can't kill the Spirit of God, I know that, but if you take your mind away from it, it's, it is almost going dormant in your life. So, that, so here what I'm suggesting is that you will give life to that which you put your mind to and you'll put, give, bring death to that which you take your mind off of. And so to be renewed is this here. Take your mind off of the things that you know are death to you and put your mind on things that you know are life to you. Now, I'm not talking about a guy who walks down the street and says, oh, that's a pretty woman. He just keeps walking. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying, no, that's a pretty woman. Wow. Yeah. That would be... See where it can go. That's when death starts to come. I can't come up with illustrations for you ladies, sorry. Be but same. Be the same? Be the same. Thank you. You know, whatever, you, you know, if it's, 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 it's not that momentary thought, say, oh, boy, that's nice, or this or that, but you go on and say, well, I shouldn't think that way. You've, you've just conquered it. You just put it to death. As soon as you say, I need to stop thinking about this, you have put it to death. That's a good thing. It comes back 10 seconds later, put it to death again by putting your mind on, you know, what a beautiful tree that is, you know, or whatever. 
Or think about the wonder of God and his presence in your life. Be renewed and you, as you learn to know your creator and become like him. Not know of your creator, but to know him in intimacy, to see into him and to, to rejoice over things he rejoices over and weep over the things that he weeps over. And the only way you'll know those things is if you get to know him. And how do you know him? You're knowing him right now, being here and allowing me the privilege of opening up Father's word to you. Sitting here with one another before, or coming in early and just fellowshipping with one another. You're knowing your Father by showing love to one another, letting them love you. Getting involved in some of the ministries at the church or in the missions and things like that. You're getting to know your Father. Opening up the scriptures in the morning and reading them. You're getting to know the Father. You're getting to know Him. And it's a lifelong process, right? But it's a wonderful journey. So to wrap this up, um, well, let's say this here. We, we, the things of this world, the earthly things, by earthly things I'm talking about things that are destructive to you that, that will eat you alive, are kind of like the vampires we, we know don't exist, but, we, but if they did, they are nothing to mess around with. I don't care how beautiful they are. They're there to suck the life out of you, take the blood and, and things like that. Or the walking dead, they may not be pretty, but they're... they're, they're they can't hurt you, but it's like this. If you think about them and put your mind in them, they come to life in you, the earthly things, and, and they will follow you around and they'll catch you and they're going to hurt you. But even if you're being hurt right now, it's a simple, not a simple thing. It can be a hard thing. Sometimes with the help of other people, help me get my mind where it needs to be. So these vampires and zombies in this world that are out to destroy me, these earthly things, can be dead to me. They will come back to life every moment that you, every time you put your mind to them. They come back to life. This side of heaven, they're going to come back to life when you give your mind and your thoughts over to them. Put it to death by putting your mind on Christ. That's why church is so important, because we come together to encourage one another. Father, thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you for your words of encouragement. Thank you for the hope that we have, Father. And I do pray that your spirit would remind us and help us to take us to that place seated in Christ, hidden in Christ, at the right hand of the Father. I pray, Father, that when we are weak, we can find people around us that can be strong and help us. I pray that when we are strong, that we won't gloat over other people who are fallen, but instead we'll put our hand down and lift them up and, and treat them with the dignity and value that they have because they are your children. Let us help each other. Let us encourage each other. Let us forgive each other and show grace to one another, even as you have shown us an abundance of grace, an all-sufficient grace to walk through this world and not be captured by the things that are earthly and destructive. Thank you for Jesus and his death on the cross for our forgiveness of our sins. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that dwells within us and renews us. And thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.